Right. And so I wanted, I wanted in a sort of linear manner to start at the beginning and ask, what were your school reports like as a 12 year old? Um, my school reports when I was 12 were, were quite good. Um, I was at, I went to a little village school when I was five and I had a very good teacher who taught me how to read and write and add up. And then my next school, I just, I was a bit of a spot, I suppose. I really liked work. I liked spelling and adding and writing and learning and um, there's nothing else to do at the school other than learn. So, <laughs> so I suppose they were quite good. Would you, um, is there anything you would tell your 12 year old self now that you know what you do now? Um, 12 year old self, uh, yeah, just get a hold of the basics. Um, it's quite boring learning how to spell and how to do your tables and, and all these things. But uh, the boring times you spend bashing it all into your head is really useful later on. I'd also say, as, as far as English is concerned, read anything and everything. Don't worry about um, reading stuff that's too grown up or good for you at this stage. Just read and read and read anything, even if it's just the back of the cereal packet. And if you don't know, if you don't understand a word in what you're reading, look it up. Um, either you'll have a, a book dictionary or you'll have your phone and you can look it up on, um, on the internet. So th there's no excuse for not knowing what something means and scratching your head. Find out. The beauty of a Kindle. Yeah. Now, um, uh, I've read that age 14, you knew that you knew the vocation that you were going to embark on. Uh, was there a particular reason why you decided to be an author? Was it a family reason? Was it a very good English teacher? Was there, what was the sort of catalyst of that decision? Um, the reason I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was about 14 was that um, good books, I, I suppose up until the age of 13, I'd read, well, I read children's books. Obviously I liked books about witches and magic spells. And then I read adventure stories. And then I read Agatha Christie murder mysteries. And then I read Alistair MacLean sort of books like Where Eagles Dare, which is a sort of mixture of action thriller and a little bit of whodunit and who's the traitor in the group kind of thing. Uh, and I got a bit stuck, I think, around about 13, 14 and hadn't moved on. And then I was given a book to read by my English teacher at school, which was David Copperfield. Massive, great 900 page book. Uh, set in Victorian England, so 1850 or so, you know, hundred more than a hundred years before I was reading it. And initially it was very sort of daunting, but quite quickly, once I got used to the rather old fashioned language, I became very wrapped up in the story, which was a thrilling story and the characters who were extremely real and exciting and humorous and sad and moving and so on. And uh, then I read another grown-up book called Pride and Prejudice, uh, which has the most off-putting and terrible title of any book in the history of books, um, and sounded like it was going to be really boring about you know, girls in funny frocks going to dances. But again, turned out to be extremely funny. And what I really loved about these books was that they were all so against authority. Um, I didn't like the school I was at, I didn't really like grown-ups. Um, I wanted to be a bit of a rebel. And then here, here were these books by these famous and august authors, David, um, Charles Dickens, Jane Austen. You know, these were names that one was supposed to revere. And yet actually what their books were was hugely um, insidious and rather sort of revolutionary and pulling the leg of all the grown-ups. And the grander the grown-ups in the books were, the vicars and the clergyman and the lady this and the lord that, the more ridiculous they were. And this completely chimed with my sort of teenage view of the world. And I thought, gosh, I love stories, I love books, I love laughter, uh, and I'm pretty good at putting sentences together. This could be a way that I could actually, you know, make a living while at the same time being rather rude towards my elders and betters. Can I, that's amazing. Can I ask, you went through, several years of boarding school, you went to study English at Cambridge, you achieved a great deal academically, school obviously went well for you. Um, you then chose to be a writer, something incredibly difficult and with no guarantee whatsoever of ever making a dime. Was that a difficult thing to undergo? And if so, how did you sort of um, get through those, those difficulties or face up to the challenges that the career would offer? 
Uh, well, I always took the view that uh, I'd need to have a day job. I, I never dreamed of making a living from writing because at uh, the time we're talking about after I left university, we're now in the mid seventies, uh, barely anyone did. And even the most um, famous writers of the day then, I suppose, Iris Murdoch and Kingsley Amis and Anthony Burgess and uh, John Fowles and other people of that generation, uh, they mostly had jobs, uh, usually teaching, which is the same today. Um, so the, the way to free yourself from any weight of burden of expectation is to have a job that pays the rent anyway. Um, but you don't want a job that's too demanding or too exhausting. Otherwise, you won't have energy and time left um, to write. So I figured teaching, well, it was the only thing I was qualified to do anyway. Um, not that I was qualified even to teach, but I taught in a rather rackety private school in North London, and they didn't ask to see any qualifications. As long as I was prepared to take a very low salary, they were prepared to let me work there. And I'd be home by 3.30 every day. And then there were the long school holidays as well. Um, and I think the difficulty for a lot of young writers getting started is that they, they take jobs that they find that they quite enjoy and become rather good at. And then you get drawn into the administrative side of work and you find yourself staying late and you don't want to do that. So um, th th that was the way I negotiated it. I did uh, teaching for about three years and then I got a job with a newspaper as a very junior reporter on a diary column. And again, I was home by 6.30 and it, it wasn't really very demanding. Can I um, ask, you've, ri you've written about um, hearing the news from a telephone box that your first book was published, was going to yes. be. Perhaps you could take us through a little bit of that moment and how that felt. It, well, it's very exciting if you have a lifelong ambition. Um, and you have to remember that as a child, uh, you know, being a published writer seems a very grand and distant thing to be. It's like wanting to be a pop star, really. Uh, not quite as glamorous, but, you know, in the same, it seems just as impossible to you when you're uh, 14 that you might uh, publish a book as it does that you might, in those days, have a record or a CD or now, you know, be massively uh, downloaded, whatever, and famous. Um, so, you know, I was still 20, I think I was 29 when, I've got my first book accepted, so still pretty young. I mean, when you're 12, 29 may sound grown up, but believe me, it isn't. Not when, you, not when you're there, you're still 12 inside your head, really. We, we can vouch for that. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I'd written, I'd completed two books, which had been really terrible, um, so really surprisingly bad. For, for a boy who'd been good at school and read lots, they were really quite poor. I found it very difficult to work out how this thing was done, but I didn't give up. I kept on getting up early and staying on late and going to bed late. And, you know, I didn't go to parties. I didn't go away at the weekend. I'd even miss holidays in order to try and figure out how to do this thing. And eventually the book that was accepted to be published was, I think it was probably the fourth one I'd finished. And it wasn't a book I particularly liked, but it was a book I felt was was likely to be published in so far as it had a beginning and a middle and an end. It had quite a strong story uh, and it was, you know, it just felt to me like something that had a chance, but it wasn't really the book I wanted to write. The book I wanted to write, I wrote afterwards. And that was, uh, that was a trick of the light, wasn't it? The first book was called A Trick of the Light, yes, but you can't, you can't buy it now because it's, it's out of print and I don't want it to be back in print. Wasn't well, maybe if you Google away, you could find it somewhere, but they'll charge you a ludicrous amount of money for it. And my advice to you is don't bother. Isn't the story, though, that the, the uh, publisher was the same person who discovered um, Sylvia Plath? Is that right? Yes. Uh, this was some, the pub, my publisher then was a man called James Mickey, uh, who worked for a company called The Bodley Head, which was a very, you know, distinguished publisher. They published, among other people, Graham Greene, in fact, he was their kind of raison d'etre at this time. Um, and James was a funny uh, guy, Scotsman, very, um, quite cautious, but, you know, very high literary intelligence. And he had discovered Sylvia Plath in a, um, a student magazine from Cambridge University. And James was pretty cautious with money, um, his own and, to be fair, his employers. So he, he wrote to young Miss Plath at um, whichever college she was at, so Newnham, I think, 
So come and have a drink with me in this pub in Soho. So Sylvia Plath, greatly excited, took the train down to London and James offered her, you know, five pounds or something for the rights to a volume of poetry. And she was so excited that she, um, she accepted. Uh, so yes, yeah, I didn't really realize when he offered to publish my book what a distinguished publisher he was, but he, I only published one book with him and then Bodley Head went sort of temporarily out of action. It was reinvented later as a, um, a non-fiction imprint, at which it still exists as actually. But, um, so I moved to a different publisher after that. So uh, for context, there's a lots of children, adults out there who are desperate to ask questions. I don't know if you can see our Q&A, but it's absolutely buzzing in. So we're going to come to those, I promise you. Yeah. Um, I'd like just to, before we also get onto the real nitty gritty of, of some of the, uh, the books that you've written, uh, there's, a, there's a funny interview in which you talk about Ian Fleming's methodology and the way, and the, and the way he writes and the, the schedule he gives himself. Can you tell us and any burgeoning writers out there the method that you have, the way you write? Is there a trick that we should know about? Um, since I've been lucky enough to be a full-time writer, which is now about 30 years, um, I just stick to the same routine, that I, same hours that I worked as a journalist, which is 10 in the morning till six at night. There's a, there's a bit of give and flexibility in that. Um, I used to think growing up that, you know, you'd wait for inspiration and you'd drink half a bottle of gin and suddenly you'd write something brilliant. But that's that's not the case. And most writers I know who do do it seriously and produce books with some regularity, uh, which appeal to people, to readers, uh, you know, it's, it's a job. Uh, so, you know, how you divvy up your day depends for you. But basically, I'm a very slow starter. So I get going about 10 30 i don't really start composing anything till about 11. a huge amount of what you do in any given day is is, is crossing out what you've done the day before i spent a whole day at a desk sometimes and ended up with a net loss of 500 words <laughs> but you you hope to put down in the course of a day about a thousand and of course your doctor will say don't sit at the desk all the time staring at the screen get up and walk around and uh, I find now that a very good time for me is this time of day, actually, between uh, five o'clock, a cup of tea, a slightly reviving, and you get a good run, then from five till seven, I find that a very, a very good time. But, you, you know, everyone must, must work out their, their own. And, you know, if you spend more than, more than eight hours continuously at it, there probably will be a slight fall off in, in the quality. Can I ask, we've got some keen historians out there and very loosely, I know many of your books are um, beautifully connected to, to real history. Jack, who's a keen historian, uh, says, the detail and accuracy of the historical settings in many of your books are my favorite elements of your writing. How do you go about undertaking that research? Um, it varies really. Uh, the, the, the difference between a historian researching and a novelist researching is the historian really has to understand everything about a period from the big wide scale right down to the narrow thing and all the details. Whereas with a novelist, all that you're required is that anything you claim has happened in the background to, one, uh, to your character must be accurate. But of course, you can't just look it up bit by bit as you go along and say, mm, is it feasible that? You, you do have to do some fairly wide reading first. And uh, for instance, in Birdsong, um, I didn't find any of the printed histories. Well, there, there's an official history of the First World War, which is quite good about sort of regimental movements, but I wasn't really writing about that. Um, so I read a huge number of first-hand documents. This entailed going to the Imperial War Museum, which has a huge archive uh, of papers, letters, postcards, diaries. The soldiers weren't allowed to keep diaries, but many of them did. And when they died, either when they died during the war or when they died as old men in the 1960s or 50s, their families, not knowing what to do with these letters and papers, thinking they might be of interest, just donated them to the Imperial War Museum. But this was, I was researching this before things had been um, put online or, or categorized and, you know, made electronically available. So it was all done with a card index. So you'd go to the desk and say, I want something about lice and rats in 1916 and they would literally bring you a, 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 a drawer this long with maybe 
200 cards in, and each card would say, would say Blogs J, and then it would give a very quick digest of, of what was in Blogs J's collection, and then you'd have Davis R, and you would then order two or three, and up they'd come. These sort of buff colored folders with a pink ribbon around them, and you pull the ribbon, and out would tumble this stuff. And I think in some cases, I was probably the first person to have read these since the cataloger at the Imperial War Museum. But from these, you got little details about in a letter home, dear Ma, the tea came up, it was cold again, or the tea came up, it tasted of petrol because they will put it in a petrol can, you know. And these are the kind of things which for a historian are kind of neither here nor there really, but for a, a novelist, that helps the reader to engage with the character. Um, it's the bird song was used, I think, by Sandhurst uh, to instruct in the realities of war, which is an amazing thing. Um, was Philip Martin's um, adaption of your book to your liking? Was it as you imagined it when it was written? Um, I, I don't really like to comment on on adaptations. Um, uh, I, I would only say I think that the, the Eddie Redmayne is a very good actor and. Um, although he didn't really physically look like the character as I had envisaged, um, you know, he's a good actor, so. Perhaps, perhaps you could give us a little bit of thought on the process of Devil May Care. I, I know we've got a lot of keen Bond fans out there. Um, Devil May Care, yes. Well, I, I, was, I was telephoned by my literary agent. Um, I say literary, in case you think it was a secret agent, <laughs> saying, you know, I've had this remarkable request from the Ian Fleming family that you should write the centenary of Ian Fleming's birth Bond book. And um, I assumed that they'd made a mistake because I'd never written a thriller and I don't read thrillers. So I'm not since the Alistair MacLean days I was talking about earlier on. Um, but, you know, I thought about it, I thought about it, and I went to meet the Fleming family and they were extremely nice. And I said, what kind of book do you want? And they said, it's entirely up to you. I said, I, I can't bring it up to date, but I could, do, I could do another one in the sequence before Ian Fleming left off in the 60s, before he lost interest, really, if you like. And they said, that would be fine. So I then read all the books. I'd only read about one or two of them before when I was quite young. And I could worked out how they worked and the great thing about the James Bond books, about Ian Fleming's books, is that he, he makes you fear for the character's safety. And that's a remarkable thing to do in a thriller because, you know, we've all, we all know that James Bond's going to survive <laughs> because he does, because we know there's another book. Um, but somehow he gets this sense of jeopardy into the story. And that seemed to me to be absolutely the key. And that was the key charm of the character when he first began. He had a, a suit and soft shoes and very nice shirts and a tiny little gun. And he was against this array of the whole of the Soviet Union, the whole of totalitarian world plus major crime syndicates full of torturers and bombs and machine guns. And here was just him in his nice little shirt and a tiny wee gun. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to get that feeling of our man, our little man with just completely on his own, almost undefended against the might of all this evil world. Um, and so I then wrote an outline of the story, what I, of what I wanted to use. And at one point I had a shootout in a caviar factory. I thought that sounded quite James Bond. And they replied, it's a good scene, but there was one of these in a Pierce Brosnan film. And of course I hadn't seen the Pierce Brosnan film, but I felt it, it, it showed I was kind of on the right line. And I took all the things I liked about the James Bond books which were the Jeopardy, first of all, uh, the girls, but I couldn't have a 1960s Dolly Bird. So I made sure that the main woman character was Bond's equal, in fact, rather superior, frankly, intellectually. And then I liked her so much, I, I gave her a sister. I also liked Felix Leiter, the CIA guy. And I just took all the bits I thought worked really well and left out all the stuff I, I didn't care for so much and brewed it all up together and hoped for the best. And the other thing I needed to find was um, a part of the world where Fleming's Bond hadn't been before. And again, that was quite easy because Ian Fleming uh, didn't like the Middle East. He had, frankly, rather appalling things to say about the Middle East and people who come from there. So that left me a massive um, area to exploit. And a quick look at the map shows you that um, Iran 
uh, borders the Caspian Sea at the south and the Soviet Union at the north of the Caspian Sea. So they were kind of connected. The Caspian Sea gives you caviar. And then by unbelievable chance, I discovered this massive and weird um, machine called an Ekrana plan, which was something that genuinely existed. It was a Soviet built thing, which was tested in the Caspian Sea. So then I had the gadgets as well, all this sort of, you know, to die for gadget. So you, you need a bit of luck, I think, when you're <laughs> making stuff up. And uh, uh, by this time, of course, I'm using the internet a lot and the internet's been massively helpful. There was, for instance, in the James Bond story, he spends, he has to go to a frontier town in the east of Iran on the border with Afghanistan. And, you know, there was no way I was going there myself. Had it been a, one of my own books, I would have had to, but it was only one page and I thought, heck, you know, I'm not going there. But I Googled and some, someone very kindly walked around all the streets with a video camera and you got absolutely everything. The only thing you couldn't get was the smell. Um, but so uh, the internet's incredibly helpful in that way. It's also very helpful for sort of negative things. I'm, I'm inventing a character who's called something like um, Simon Smith. And I don't want there to be a famous Simon Smith who's going to take offense or sue me. And so for instance, I wanted a footballer in another book I was writing called A Week in December. And I wanted him to have a very English footballer's name that was something like Lee Jones. But I had to change it endless times until I finally found one who wasn't someone else. From from Bond quick from Bond quickly to, to Jeeves and the wedding bells. It's a selfish question because P.J. Woodhouse is a consistent feature in my family. Um, taking on a, I know you've spoken a bit a bit about parody and that kind of thing, but taking on you know taking on the the Jedi Master of hidden laughter and crouching tiger, as another journalist once wrote. What do you feel? Did you feel, or did you feel pressure from the literary crowd in in an undertaking like that? Was it a was it a an amazing thing taking on a book of that magnitude? Uh, well, when I was first offered that, I said, no, no, I can't. I mean, it's one thing to take a James Bond book and work out the mechanics of how the engine works. And Fleming's style is relatively easy to do a version of because it's a newspaper man style. And I trained as a newspaper man as he had. But P.G. Woodhouse is one of the most accomplished stylists of the 20th century. And it's, it's his, his writing, his sentences are things of, of beauty, really. And so I said, no, that would be a bridge too far and I'd be you know, asking for trouble. Um, but as I may have mentioned earlier on, I never can resist a challenge. And um, when I was, on a, I was in a, on a plane going to India and I just read one of the Woodhouse books and I suddenly had this idea, well, suppose you inverted the master and servant relationship that would at least give you a really solid basis for comedy. And then I began to write it and I found, I could just sort of hear Woodhouse's voice really. And I didn't reread the Woodhouse books. I'd, I'd read them all probably two or three times each anyway. So I didn't really feel the need to. I suppose having had a, a fairly similar education to uh, Woodhouse in terms of doing a lot of Latin and Greek and Shakespeare, had a lot of the range of references that Bertie will get wrong um, <coughs> already in my head. But it, it, it was a, a, a very naughty thing to attempt, really. It was very presumptuous. And I took a lot of uh, stick uh, initially when it was announced on the internet. I remember a guy saying, you know, who does this fat bearded git think he is to um, take on the master? And I told my wife and she said, you're not that fat. And um, so that was, that was some comfort. But um, people liked it, I'm happy to say. Absolutely. They, they very much did. Um, I'm very aware we've already taken too much of your time. So we're going to try and throw you some very quick hospital pass questions and okay. ask you to answer them as concisely as possible. A little quick fire round. We've got a 30 second game, which will make you very popular with our, with our audience. And then, and then we'll send you on your way. So very quick question from me, which is a really mean one, but what is it that makes great writing? Um, a big idea and manic attention to detail, choosing every word. Sebastian, what's your favorite book that you've written? Um, Human Traces. And favorite that you've read? Um, great Expectations. Uh, are you, uh, um, do you write on paper or on computer now? Uh, computer. 
if you had not become a writer, what would you be? Uh, a diplomat or a psychiatrist. Both great choices. Uh, your favourite character in any book, says Olivia. Um, am I keeping these answers short enough? <laughs> my my favourite character in any book. Um, that, they, that you've written. Oh, that I've written. Mm. Uh, well, I'm I'm very fond of a character called Kitty, also in Human Traces. But otherwise, I would also say Mike Engleby, though um, danger because he's not for not for young people, and he's he's dangerous. And I'm going to sneak in there with the final question. I also, have one. You've got one too. I've got one, which is from William, which is, how do you know when you're finished a book? Uh, well, because I know where I'm going. So it's like, uh, I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I know when I set out, I'm leaving London, I'm going to arrive in St. Mark's Square in Venice. And when I pull into St. Mark's Square, I sure know I'm there. Sebastian, you, you spoke at the beginning about teaching at a fairly rickety prep school. We're going to finish talking about, an e well, not equally, uh, a, a rickety prep school. I think it's a very good prep school. Uh, Dan says, who is at the helm of that school, he has an assembly tomorrow. And uh, it's an important time this for children, especially. Uh, do you have a key message that he could use in his assembly when talking to children tomorrow? Um, yes, what, we are, what this country and the rest of the world is going through is not, as people keep saying, unprecedented. Um, the Spanish flu epidemic a hundred years ago was far worse. Um, we're getting we're getting over it. We're past the worst. And for people of my generation, this is as nothing compared to what my parents' generation went through in the Second World War and what my grandparents in the war before that. So I would say um, it's very difficult uh, for them because they've got nothing to compare it with. But for old geezers like me, uh, I can assure his him and his uh, pupils that this is, is not too bad, even if they may have lost a, a grandparent or something. And that even the very worst, most trying things in life do pass. The bad side of that is unfortunately the really good things pass as well. But let's look on the bright side as, as we are. Wonderful, wonderful positivity. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to have you join us. If you can spare us another 20 or 30 seconds. Yeah. I don't know if you got our note about playing a little game called Biscuit Face. Oh, shoot, I haven't got the biscuit. Do you have anything that could float down your forehead? Like, um, a, you could be our first non-biscuit contender. Can I do it without a biscuit? Or, or perhaps you, you could be, you could be, I don't know what you think, Walter, we could bend the rules. He, Sebastian could be above biscuit face. I think, I think, uh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think so, we've taken too much of your time. What we'll do is we'll put a big question mark on our biscuit face leaderboard. And, um, and we'll make sure that, that you're neither a winner nor a loser. And, uh, and for all those at home, I'm sorry we've run over, but you will play Biscuit Face again with us on Wednesday. Sebastian, we're really, really grateful. Thank you so, so much. I hope you enjoy some cricket and some tennis this summer. We keep our fingers crossed. And we will very much look forward to all of these children who've been involved getting stuck into your books if they haven't already. So thank you. Thank you. It's been great fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sebastian. Bye-bye.